Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings, 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 beloved. I am Mama Pam, a.k.a. Pamela Dobson, and I do read, beloved, seven minutes every day, so you do not have to read. Praise God. We are the Smurf family, international ministry, and we are getting ready to read the commentary for the read for today, which was, today is Friday, 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 Judges, uh, the 41st chapter, vet, <laughs> Judges, the ninth chapter and the 41st verse. My tablet that went down. I read from EnduringWord.com. You can find where I'm reading. Go online. You can find it just like I'm reading it. Uh, uh, Judges, the ninth chapter. Scrolling it down. Ninth chapter and the 41st verses. That's 21. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Nine and 41st. Abimelech de defeats the rebellion of the men of Sitchim. I think we read that. Read with him. Follow the plan suggested. Yeah, Zebo deceived him. All right, here we go. 40, okay, 42. Abimelech attacks the citizens of Sitchim and conquers the city. And that's uh, EnduringWord.com, number five. EnduringWord.com, number five. Praise God. All right. Will you, um, everyone is that is here and that is coming in, please stop talking. Please stop talking. Please stop commenting. Because if you're commenting, you're not listening. And I need you to put on your listening ears right now. And you can talk to me when it's over. I'll, I'll see what you got to say and I'll talk back to you and all that good stuff. But right now, let's pay, be attentive to what's being read, okay? All right. So it came about on the next day. With the resistance of Gaul defeated, Abimelech would find it easy to establish his control over the city of Sitchum again. Both outside and inside the city, they effectively attacked and killed the people of Sitchum. Even those not directly involved in the rebellion, they just went on just killing folks. The people apparently confident that the matter was concluded went out into the fields as usual to engage in their daily activities. But he took the city and killed the people who were in it, and he demolished the city and sowed it with salt. So Abimelech then turned his fury against the people of Sitchum and killed as many of them as he could, and he demolished their city. So indeed, Sitchum was not built until the reign of Jer 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 Jeroboam. Ah, Jer Jeroboam the first, almost two centuries later, First Kings 12 and 25 says. So this shows the problem of following a man who comes to power through violence. Commonly, it is only a matter of time until the same violence is turned against those who helped him come to power. <laughs> Here in the United States, our previous president, Turn against everybody. They're dropping like flies now. And he ain't thinking about none of them. <laughs> so Bimelech took an axe in his hand. And he cut down a bow. What you see me do? Make haste and do as I have done. So though Abimelech was an ungodly and violent man. He did understand some basic principles of leadership. And strategizing. He strategized that thing. He understood the importance of leading through the example of one's own actions. He could tell his troops to do as I have done, and they did. Matter of fact, a good leader, a supervisor on the job, he'll tell you, make sure you come back from your breaks on time every day. Take a 30-minute lunch, not any longer. The boss will do the same thing. They make sure they come in. Amen, that's a good boss. All the people of the Tower of Sitchum died, about a thousand men and women. So with this, Abimelech massacred the last survivors of the city of Sitchum, killing about a thousand men and women. This graphically fulfilled the warning of Jotham earlier in chapter Judges 9, 19, and 20. That's his baby brother that prophesied this was going to happen. So this was as if a man should run into a stack of straw or barrel of gunpowder. To secure himself from a raging fire. Their covenant with Baal, the image of jealousy, in Ezekiel 8 and 3, 
was the cause of their ruin. They looked upon this hole as both a fort and a sanctuary, but it saved them not. For the people of Sitchum, even a secure tower could not protect them. Yet, there is a more secure tower in the Tower of Sitchum. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. It says the righteous run into it and they are saved. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Okay, that's what to say, y'all. Songs just be coming in me when I see certain stuff. So it says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are saved. Proverbs 18 and 10. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Psalms 61 and 3. God's judgment on Abimelech. Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. Now, after his brutal victory at the tower of Shechem, Sechem, Abimelech probably thought he was an expert at attacking towers. So he went to Thebes and he attacked that city and that tower there. And a certain woman, don't say a name, just say a certain woman, dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. At Thebes, a woman dropped a millstone on Abimelech's head and mortally wounded him. Now this was probably a stone used to grind uh, used to grind the grain by hand. Such hand stones averaged 10 to 15 inches long and weighed about 5 pounds or more. Because they had that, you remember them stones y'all see they have to grind that week, they're big heavy stones. Draw your sword and kill me. Least men say a woman killed him. So Abimelech considered it manlier to be killed by his own armor bearer. But he was still dead after. Either way, he's going to be dead. Proud even in death. He then had to answer to God <laughs> for his wicked actions. Yet long after his death, the credit continued to be given to the woman. So it was still recorded that the woman killed him. 2 Samuel 11 and 21. But commentators observe it for, just, for a just hand of God upon Abimelech, that upon one stone he had slain his 70 brethren. Wow. And now one stone slayed him. His head had stolen the crown of Israel, and now his head is smitten. All right, and then. Summation, the certainty of God's judgment. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech. We can be certain that God will repay wickedness either in this life or in the life to come. Often, God finds a way to do it both in this life and in the life to come. On them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. God had warned the men of Setchem through Jotham, yet they rejected the warning of God, and therefore they came to ruin. We should each consider if God is warning us about something in the present time, the story of Abimelech, the men of Sitchum, and Jotham shows us that there is a real and terrible price to pay for rejecting God's warning. It's real simple. Praise God. So that's um, Judges 9. Now we go to Judges 10, all of chapter 10. <clears throat> Two minor judges and more oppression. So after uh, Abimelech there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in she Shemar in the mountains of Ephraim. He judged Israel for 23 years and he died and was buried in Shemar. There arose to save Israel, Tula. Now we are not told much about the career of Judge Tula only that his service was as a judge lasted a relatively long time, 23 years. Jar. After him arose Jar. We also know little about Jar. Jar's service as a leader of Israel 
we do know that he served about the same number of years as Tula before him, 22 years. Now, Jar had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they also had 30 towns, and I bet they was all named after each one of them 30 sons. This shows that Jar was a polygamous man and a man of wealth and prestige. His many sons had fancy transportation and their territory to rule. Jar never took the title of king, but it seems that he acted like one. Apostasy. Apostasy, servitude, and supplication. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. This phrase is repeated seven times in the book of Judges. It shows that the evil of Israel was even worse because they did it before the eyes of God. We could say that it's bad to commit adultery, but it's far more offensive to commit adultery before the eyes of your spouse. And they served the Baals and the Asteros. The essence of Israel's sin was they served other gods. Here, seven different ethnic and national gods are mentioned that Israel went after in idolatry. Israel was attracted to these other gods, not because of the beauty and idol of an idol image, but because of what was associated with the pagan deity. Baal, the weather god, was associated with financial success. Astaroth, the goddess of fertility, was associated with love, sex, and romance. As for the other gods of the neighboring nations around them, it was a matter of conforming to the popular culture and doing what everyone else did, which is what we do today. Everybody else doing, we run and do it. Israel's worship of neighboring gods reminds us that the people of God are often in danger of worshiping what the world worships. We follow the fashion trends, whatever they wear. It. We wear holes in our jeans because somebody came up and started wearing holes in their jeans. What's wrong with y'all? What's wrong with y'all? That was a time they had a group called Crisscross. They wore their clothes backwards. Everybody's wearing their clothes backwards. Ain't y'all got a brand of your own? That's what the Lord's saying. So they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Perhaps Israel did not consciously forsake God. Yet, adding the worship of pagan gods to the worship of the, the true God was to forsake the Lord. It seems that Israel was willing to worship just about anything except the true God. So when a man stops believing in God, he does not believe in nothing. He believes in anything. According to Peter, Martyr giveth these two reasons here why the Israelites went so, went so a-whoring after these false gods of the several neighbor nations. Because they so flourished in wealth and honor, when themselves were so poor and contemptible, because the worship of the true God was so severe, but the heathenism, superstition, licentious, and ple pleasing to flesh and blood. Israel's servitude. Israel's servitude. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. If Israel wanted to serve the gods of the Philistines and the Amorites, God would allow them to do so. He allowed them in the fullest sense by selling them into the servitude to the Philistines and the Amorites. You want to go be with them? Go on over there then. God let them go. Let them have their way. They harassed and oppressed the children. So they went over there with them peoples that they wanted to be with. And God let them be harassed and oppressed, the children of Israel. Of course, Israel was never blessed when they served these other gods. Instead, they were harassed and oppressed. They were severely distressed. God gave them what they wanted. We have sinned against you. So the words of this Christ seem fine. But God's response seems to indicate that he saw something lacking in Israel's repentance. One may cry out to the Lord, yet really just wish things were different. Crying out to God with a voice is not necessarily the same as crying out to him with our heart. Your voice may be making a lot of noise, but has your heart changed? 
God wanted from Israel the same thing that he wants from us. A heart that will put its hand to the plow and not look back. Luke 9, 6 and, 9 and 62. He wants us to come to the place where we know that there is nothing worth following except God. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. So God was harsh with Israel because they had to be genuinely sick of their sin before they would genuinely turn to God. God allowed Israel to experience the sickness of their sin. For the first time, it is recorded, he refused to save them, reminding them of how repeatedly they had delivered, how repeatedly he had delivered them, and yet they had turned back to their evil courses. In the message of his anger, there was clearly evident a purpose of love. This apparent rejection and the apparent indifference to the pleas of his people was designed to test the insincerity of their response. One technique used to help people stop smoking is to put them in a small, unventilated room and make them smoke for hours on end until they can hardly bear it. It makes them sick of smoking and it makes them truly want to stop. In the same way, sometimes God will allow the natural consequences of our own sin to crash upon us in concentrated form so we can become sick of our sin and sales, which you have chosen. So you have not been forced to worship these little gods by your oppressors and tyrants, but you freely chosen these gods before me, God says. Repent from Israel, repentance from Israel, mercy from God. Do to us whatever seems best to you. So this indicates that Israel came to the place of total surrender to God. The prayer that comes most natural to us is, do to me whatever seems best to me. The change in heart meant that the season of affliction eventually did affect Israel in a good way. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. Israel finally discovered that the worst of serving God is better than the best of serving idols. His soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. God looked upon disobedient Israel with compassion, not with hatred. It was difficult for God to allow Israel to stay in their misery, though it was best for them. Like the perfect loving parent, God hated to see Israel suffer, even when it was good for them. He longed to rescue them, but would not do it until it was good for them. The Hebrew word literally means import impatience. It suggests God's restlessness in the presence of suffering. It is the restlessness of his love, and that is the cause of his anger and the governing principle in all of his activities. God grieves for the miseries to which his creatures are reduced by their own sins. Be astonished, ye heavens, at this, and shout for joy, all ye inhabitants of the earth. For through the love which his compassion flowed, God has visited and redeemed a lost world. His soul was grieved, not properly or as to inward aff affection, for God, being infinitely happy, is not capable of grieving, but figuratively and as to outward expression, he acted towards them like one that felt their suffering. And now he grieves over you. If only you would forsake your sins and turn to him, he would assuredly raise up a Jephthah for your help. Israel gathers, but without a leader. So now the children of Israel assembled together and encamped in Mizpah in response to the Ammonite threat. Israel gathers together for defense. Who is the man who will begin the fight against the people of Ammon? So Israel gathered, but had no leader. God's pattern for doing great works among his people is to raise up a man. He could do the work all by himself. He could send angels to do the work for him. He could use a leader, leaderless mob or a committee. Yet, God's normal means of operating is to raise up 
a man and through that man to do a great work because God uses leaders. God needs Mama Pams in this world that it just come forth and just do what he tell them to do. That concludes our commentary read for this evening. I do thank you and appreciate you. Enjoy this recording. And if the Lord lays on your heart to give a financial blessing, please do. Dollar sign Mama Pam 23. Dollar sign Mama Pam 23. Praise God.